Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's event on how to prevent data breaches with Go Anywhere. In the next 60 minutes or so, we'll talk about the cold, hard reality of data breaches and then the better news of how managed file transfer can help prevent them. We'll send you a copy of the recording after the event if you'd like to rewatch anything. And as we go, if you have questions, please submit them through your control panel in the questions pane. If we don't get to your questions and we have time at the end, we'll try to get to them live. Otherwise, we'll make sure to follow up after the presentation. I am joined today by my co-host, Dan Freeman. Hey, Dan, are you all set? I think I am. Great. So to give everyone a quick introduction to Dan, if you haven't been on his webinars before, Dan has spent the last 10 years of his career in various security roles, ranging from systems engineer to security officer, and he currently serves as senior solutions consultant at Help Systems for the Go Anywhere product line. So let's take a quick look at our agenda for today's webinar. We're going to talk about the risk of data breaches, including some interesting statistics around the cost of data breaches to today's organizations. We'll discuss how managed file transfer can help. We'll show you our Go Anywhere solution in action, and we'll finish with a quick Q&A session if time permits. All right, Dan, I'll let you take it from here. All right, I appreciate it, Brooke. And thanks for everyone for taking the time out to sit on this webinar, taking a peek at how managed file transfer and Go Anywhere specifically can help prevent your systems from being hacked. Now, having said that, Go Anywhere will most likely just be a segment of probably your entire network and systems but we can provide you with the latest encryption ciphers and algorithms to safely transfer your, and store your data. Now, before we get started, I do have three, dis three disclaimers. If you happen to sit on the Think Like a Hacker webinar a few weeks back, the first couple minutes or slides will be a little bit of a recap. Number two, for those existing Go Anywhere, Go Anywhere customers, there'll be a little bit of a Go Anywhere 101 basics so we can get those that are not familiar with Go Anywhere some context as to what we're doing. And the third disclaimer is the joke I'm about to tell you is pretty bad. In other news, did you guys hear about the latest big cyber attack? Yep, the government is on high alert looking for him. Unfortunately, they don't know exactly where he or she went. They just know that they ran somewhere. Okay, I'll wait till the laughter starts here and we can get jumped in. All right, let's get jumping into why we're here. Let's talk about some of the ways that going Anywhere can help in preventing those data breaches. As we all know, data breaches are bad uh, from financial loss, potential secrets being leaked, customer data compromised, basically everything leading up to tarnished rep reputations and can be very, very resource intensive and consuming to get everything back the way it was. Now, how do we avoid this potential disaster? Well, as mentioned earlier, I don't have the comprehensive answer and neither does Go Anywhere, but we can definitely show you a few, are a few areas where Go Anywhere can assist. Let's first take a look at some stats on 2018 as related to the breaches and their cost. Now for the next few slides, I use both the Verizon DBIR or Data Breach Investigative Report from 2018, as well as the cost analysis report conducted by the Panama Institute. This first one here, there weren't a ton of high profile breaches as there were in recent years. A couple years ago, Equifax. Uh, last year, you had Yahoo and Facebook had some fairly large breaches. But this is going to be just a kind of a breakdown of what happened here. So you'll notice, at least from the per capita standpoint, uh, this last year, 2018, was just a smidge, $7 more per incident than last year. But you'll kind of see over the last five years, they've been right around the 145 ish. Um, uh, rate per, per incident. By country or region, um, the United States shines above the rest, unfortunately, that's probably not a good thing, as the highest per capita cost per breach at $233 per record. And then you have CA and Germany respectively below that. And then Turkey, India, Brazil, much lower per capita cost at 105, 68, and 67 per record. Assuming, I think the obvious things are going to be uh, the, the amount of uh, target vectors that each country might have, um, that's probably going to be a lot of things, and maybe other things, maybe not as good security, uh, whatever the case may be. This next one here, uh, we're going to kind of look at the per capita cost by industry. Uh, so the first one on the left, if you can see that, the left uh, bottom left graph there, is kind of going through the frequency of, of samples by industry. 
I don't think it's a huge surprise probably to most folks, but financial services getting hit the most with services and industrial manufacturing kind of behind that. But then the other one to kind of point out way down the list, like the fifth one from the bottom is healthcare. Uh, only reason why I point that one out is if you look at the next graph over to the right, if you look at the actual cost per record by industry, healthcare far and away blows everybody away as far as how much per record those um, those breaches are costing those companies. Uh, financial, a little bit behind them. But the reason why financial, I think, in health kind of in comparison is when we look at these uh, certain types of things, with the health industry, you've got your protected health information uh, versus maybe financial data, credit card information, account number. Well, with those types of information, financial data, users can pretty much just put it on hold, suspend, change their credit card, cancel, things like that. So that's kind of a one and done or a very, very time limited basis. With PHI, you really obviously can't change who you are, some of those things. Uh, things like um, healthcare industry or healthcare premiums being so high, it can be very lucrative to get individuals uh, healthcare information to maybe start accounts and do payments on their information. Also, maybe to the fact that maybe you don't want things to get out in the open. So there could be blackmailing going on for different individuals. Point is, the shelf life for financial data, very, very short, whereas the shelf life for healthcare information can be very, very long. And one stat I saw last year, on the black market, financial data, like credit card information, could be right around a dollar per record. Whereas if you start adding PHI, it starts somewhere around $20 per record. So it definitely can be more lucrative. And that's why I think you're seeing that. Here's some of the cyber statistics by cost. Um, the black items on the, the going to the right are gonna be how, you're, how you can save money. The blue ones going left are gonna be your cost additions. Not gonna point through all these, but your instant response team, extensive use of encryption. We'll definitely talk about encryption more often. Um, your business continuity management involvement, employee training, but basically the three of the top four are human involvement of some sort. Uh, we'll kind of point on the one down there, extensive use of DLP or your data loss prevention appliances. But again, those are gonna be things that you can do to save you, and again, by those dollar amounts per record, how much? Now you look at the bottom, and you talk about kind of compliance failures, um, where we can talk about how we have built-in security auditing uh, reports that can look at your current configuration and point it against, well, we're gonna point it against uh, kind of a PCI DSS type standard, but it'll look to see how you have go anywhere currently configured, where you're lacking, where you're failing, give you mitigation steps, and then obviously map it to a PCI DSS security setting. We can take a look at that when we jump in there. Keep on rolling here. Uh, the root causes for a lot of these breaches, um, the one that, to me that stands out is that 27%, that human error. I think this really gets to the point on how MFT in general and Go Anywhere can help you hopefully try to eliminate that as much as possible through that workflow automation, uh, things that we'll talk about. Uh, system glitches, again, you can do from configuration settings. I think those reports to kind of tell you where you're at can help you with that. And then malicious or criminal attack, and we'll look at breakdown of that 48%, but a lot of it is sometimes insider misuse. Uh, so in that case, we can do a lot of auditing and access control to help mitigate some of those as well. So some of the key findings, I guess, from the 2018, you had a 6% uh, increase in total cost, 4% on uh, capita, and 2.2 as far as the number of records that were breached in 2018 as compared to 2017. Average breach, 3.8 million, so not really complete chump change, at least for a lot of organizations. Uh, again, the hacker and insider threat, so it's not just outside users, it can be malicious insiders comprised of almost half of all the breaches. This next bullet point, we didn't really touch on in the previous slides, but the mean time to identify, uh, usually those breaches is 197 days in 2018. And if you just kind of sit back and think about that for a second, um, that's that's a long time. That's a really long time for folks to be sitting on your network doing network probing, uh, discovery, to really uh, pull and infiltrate data out of your network without you even knowing. Uh, mean time to contain once you do find it, about 69 days. Again, a long time for you to get those, um, those uh, fixes mitigated. And then both that uh, mean time to identify and contain were highest for malicious criminal attacks versus human error. 
I think that's kind of common sense. If it's a malicious or criminal attack, most of the time it's going to, to be somebody having to find that, uh, whether or not you have proper defenses in place. Whereas human error, we'd like to think most humans have a moral compass and they actually know when they did an error and they will actually tell it. That's uh, probably part of the reason why those are a little bit shorter on the identifying and contain because they probably know what they did. There's a couple other ones that third party involvement. If you think of like Target, when they had their HVAC uh, contractors, how they actually got hacked way back a few years ago. Um, anytime you have third party involvement, it's going to cost increase because you have to deal with somebody else. Same, same thing for cloud migration. Uh, there's usually a lot of IT folks uh, in, in action there to help identify what resources that we need to deal with. So that can be another tough one to deal with. Okay, so that kind of gives you that uh, maybe shock factor on uh, what we're looking at as far as how breaches can affect your organization uh, and some of those, especially from the, the bottom line standpoint. You know, what are we actually doing from the bottom line? Let's look at how managed file transfer can help. On this one, we've got, we'll say, four pillars of a generic idea of where uh, MFT can help prevent uh, data breaches. I do actually want to take a second to, to make sure you read that, that title there, how MFT helps prevent data breaches. Uh, one thing I've noticed in our industry and other industries as well um, that kind of is, is a little misleading, I think, is when uh, vendors will say that their product is something compliant or can make you something compliant. Um, that's pretty tough to swallow uh, from out of the box. Um, usually, those those programs or those uh, software solutions, especially like ours, we give you those cipher suites and algorithms and key exchange methods to configure the product to make that application compliant as far as whether it's PCI, whether it's NIST compliance, whether it's FISMA, HIPAA, whatever the case may be. But you got to realize two things. One, it's how you configure it. We give you the tools to configure it properly. And two, usually this application is only going to be a part of your entire system that's under scope. So that's kind of maybe just a, a quick FYI when I definitely mentioned how we can help you prevent data breaches. I don't want to be misleading like I see a lot of folks kind of do every once in a while. Having said that, uh, encryption. Uh, there's going to be two things I'm going to say if you don't remember anything from this webinar, because I know it's going to be a lot going on. This is one of them. Uh, encryption is a, kind of an easier way and a, and a really good way to cover a lot of how breaches happen. We need to make sure that we're encrypting our data both in transit and at rest. Um, you know, whether it's server to server, user to system, person to person, whatever the case may be, we definitely want to make sure that we are encrypting our data. Alerting. Um, alerting is great, and we'll talk about auditing in a second here. But you know, auditing, log files, all those things are great. But if nobody's paying attention to them, if nobody's getting alerted on them, they can almost be a moot point. And you're maybe just checking boxes for your auditor at that point. So alerting, uh, whether it's you know the files that you're trying to send out, they fail. Whether it's just system alerts, uh, your service going offline. Um, admin alerts, the account gets disabled and it's tied to an SLA. You definitely want to be on the forefront of things like that to make sure that these actually go through. Uh, and we'll talk about more triggered alerting as well. The automation piece, this is where you know you try to eliminate that 27% that we just looked at of data breaches caused by human error. So if we can eliminate the human processes, those manual processes, as much as we can and make it automated, then we can hopefully eliminate some of those human error and get rid of that, again, that 27%. And then audit and access. Um, if you guys are uh, part of any kind of compliance regulation, you'll know that auditing and accountability as well as access control are usually two very, very important security families that need to be addressed for pretty much any chance of securing, securing your systems. You definitely want to have insight into what users are doing, when they're doing it, what files are changing, when they're doing, et cetera. Um, also have good tight access control for least privilege and allow only what's needed per user. On that note, that's kind of the second one I want you to remember, if nothing else. Um, if you have for your access controls, I highly recommend multi-factor or two-factor authentication. It really makes it difficult for hackers to get into your credentials if you have a two, some form of two-step verification. Um, on that note, bad joke number two, what's the hardest step in a hacker's career? Two-step verification. I'm sure you guys got that one. 
Anywho, we'll keep on moving. All right, so encryption in depth here. We'll look at on the move. Uh, this is obviously applying encryption uh, for in transfer. Uh, we will have the latest cipher suites and protocols as defined by NIST uh, to make sure that we are FIPS 140 compliant, or at least have the capability of configuring it that way. Uh, these are going to be things like your you know, HTTPS channels, your SFTP, FTPS, whether you're using certificate, TLS encryption, uh, SSH technology, we can have the means for you to have that ability to transfer those files securely. At rest, uh, we definitely want to have an ability to provide to you if you don't have your own, say, disk level encryption or storage that is actually uh, encrypted at rest. We have a few ways to do that, whether we're going to do our encrypted folders, uh, whether we're going to leverage PGP file level encryption for those files to be encrypted at rest. Um, also going to have lots of different modules, uh, and we'll look at them here in a little bit, like your secure mail, secure forms, um, uh, your Go drive, uh, any passwords. All of those can be encrypted with the master encryption key, which again we'll mention in a second. Uh, leveraging AES 256-bit encryption for those files at rest. Now, how do we manage those keys? This is going to be managed by a database-driven key management system for your three keys, your certificates, your SSH, and PGP keys. And again, we'll jump into that. The master encryption keys, like we mentioned, uh, those have always been available. Uh, just recently, a couple versions ago, we added it to where you can rotate the keys. Um, there's nothing you can do from a, a management or configuration of the actual keys themselves. You just have the ability to add new keys so that you can rotate them, say, every year, every two years. Um, a lot of times that is another compliance regulation that you, that you actually rotate some of your master encryption keys. Alerting. Uh, we have things like system alerts, like we mentioned. Um, we can look at system events. So if you have uh, the, the service actually goes on, you have a cluster. One of them goes out of the one of the nodes go out of the cluster. You have a gateway in front of it. The gateway goes offline. It can't communicate. You can get an email or SMS alert on those types of things. Uh, things like your thresholds. Um, we talk about certificate uh, protection on certain uh, protocols or PGP file level encryption those individual keys can have a threshold of say, hey, these are gonna expire in 30 days. Someone needs to be notified. Triggered events, we'll go through a few of those as well as examples, uh, but these are gonna be based off of web user activity. For those who are not Go Anywhere customers, web users, think of those as the folks that you're creating to log into Go Anywhere to leverage whatever service you're offering, whether it's SFTP, the web client, FTPS, FTP, some of our proprietary protocols. The actions that they're doing, whether they're uploading successfully, their account gets disabled, um, they downloaded something successfully, they upload failed, uh, things like that. We can actually trigger an action, whether it's calling a project, whether it's doing some simple file movement, executing native commands, or simply sending an email to let people know. The project logic, we'll talk about a little bit. We won't go in depth too much on projects, but that's going to be where you're doing your automation. At a very high level, think of it as kind of traditional scripting. So if you have a script that's grabbing a file and it's FTPing it out the door to somebody, if something fails in there, usually in scripts you don't have retry logic, you don't have you know, uh, notifications within your projects, now we can actually put some of that error logic in there to where maybe we do try some retries or we just send an email notification to the person responsible for that product to let them know that this actually failed or was successful, either one. And then built in alerts, we'll look at the schedulers and monitors. Um, on schedules, you have built-in alerts to see if the project that was called that was successful or not, and monitor, same type of thing. We'll talk a little bit more about those. And a little sneak peek, this is, I'll definitely mention ones that are not out today, but our latest stable release, 604, does not have SLAs, but that is going to be coming out in our release here very, very soon uh, in 6.1. Uh, so I won't dive too much into that. I'll just give you a little, a little teaser on a couple of things that are coming. Automation projects, kind of touch on that real quick, but just kind of your way to create some sort of business function by selecting action items uh, to build out whatever kind of data manipulation or movement that you want to do. And we'll look at a couple. Uh, schedulers, again, pretty much um, straightforward as far as the schedulers are concerned. There is a repeat option in there, um, so it's kind of a built-in retries. Uh, upon success, failure, or even conditional logic, uh, looking at certain variables and what their values are, depending upon what they are, you kick the schedule off or you don't. 
Monitors are going to be file system monitoring, kind of what it says. You're going to be looking at certain uh, folders for certain types of files, certain event types, to then grab, make a, a file list, and pass it to a project for further processing. Triggers, I won't talk much on that because we'll go through a few examples, but again, that's going to be off web user activity. And then the API down at the bottom, uh, we do have uh, Go Anywhere commandlets. They're free out on our site that you can download that can use command line interface to basically call projects. That's gonna be one of the ones. There's a lot of web user management you can do and a lot of project management you can do from those. Uh, you can also use web services. We have another web services guide out there as well uh, that you can leverage SOAP or REST from maybe a custom application uh, to call a different project or do anything within the going or commandlets uh, that you wanna do just using SOAP or REST uh, protocols. And audit and access. Um, we do have administrative role-based access. Uh, this can help maintain that job separation duties, least privilege. Um, and another teaser we'll look at is we do have, we just added a custom role in the 6.1 beta. That isn't out yet, but it's coming. I'll kind of show you a little teaser on that when we get in the product. Multi-factor authentication. Again, this is kind of that point number two. If you don't remember anything from this, we got point number one is encryption, two is multi-factor authentication. Uh, we have it for both web and admin users, um, a lot of different MFA options, and we'll look at those on the service listeners. The built-in accounts disabled uh, just came out in 6.0, so the current release has this. So when you first install the product, we are now disabling the built-in root and admin accounts. You will be forced to create an actual admin account upon login. Detailed logging, again, we're going to be looking at all the service listeners, protocols, admin user usage, web user activities anything from the files that are going in and out of go anywhere we'll look at all of those as well and then syslog options kind of threw that down there because you do have the ability maybe you don't want to use go anywhere as uh, your central place to look at log files or get alerted on you can pass all those logs that you're getting in from go anywhere out to a syslog server Okay, this is the one-on-one -on -one basics I warn the current Go Anywhere customers about. We're just gonna run through this very, very quickly. I just wanna give a general overview of what's going on with Go Anywhere. Um, as you may or may not have kind of figured out, we can act as both the inbound and outbound side of things. So if you wanna be an FTP, uh, FTPS, SFTP, HTTPS web client, you can act as that type of server. We can also do outbound connections uh, where you're actually doing the file initiation, whether it's data translation or movement. That's going to be done by workflow automation, and I'm just going to jump down here to point out these are going to be what we call resources, and resources are Go Anywhere's way of acting as the client. So this is us reaching out, putting in connection information, and reaching out to other servers and services, whether it's other FTP uh, servers, whether it's network shares on your network for origination or destination locations or places where you're doing file monitors connecting out to Amazon S3 buckets or Azure Blob services or any other web services. Uh, database is very common. Maybe you wanna dip into a backend customer database because files aren't files yet, haven't been prepared. You can do a select statement, pull out what the information you want, put it into a CSV, a flat file, whatever the case may be, Excel file, put it into a certain directory, kick off a project to PGP encrypt it and then SFTP it out the door. Point is, and we'll look at some of the other ones in here, this is how we act as the client to connect out to other resources to further expand the capabilities of Go Anywhere. We'll again, we'll look at the workflow automation as what we call projects, some encryption methods, and a few of these other items here. The audit logging, again, lots of detailed audit logs. We'll, we'll jump in there when we look at the, uh, uh, jump into the product as well. With those detailed audit logs though, we can generate uh, different reports. Um, I think there's 25 currently canned reports that you can just generate ad hoc or put them into a project on a scheduler uh, to send to your C-level staff or, you know, help desk or whoever needs to see them. But you'll have access, obviously, to the back-end database. And if your DBAs uh, want to do some custom reports, they can do so. And then, of course, pointing out our alerts. I know we talked briefly about them. We'll look at them when we jump in. But that's obviously going to be... Uh, hand in hand with those detailed audit logs so that we can send out appropriate uh, alerts to certain folks so that we can stay in the forefront of a lot of these potential issues uh, that we might have. Okay, let's go and I've just got, I think one more slide and then we'll get rolling here. Okay, so this, especially, uh, this is gonna be on the uh, the DMZ side 
Uh, let me get a different color here. There we go. So this here, what we're looking at is the Go Anywhere Gateway. Uh, this is, <clears throat> for the most part, going to be installing a service. Uh, it is going to be a broker from the outside, uh, whether it's your customers, trading partners, whoever it is, or just external web users, coming back into your internal network where MFTs can be installed. So say you've got SFTP on port 22 that you're listening on back here in MFT, and you've got all kinds of different you know, network locations that they have as far as what you're giving them access to when they log in. Similar to if they log in via WinSCP, they get a folder structure that you've defined. Where these are, who knows? It could be an Amazon S3 bucket, it could be just a network share, we don't know. Point is, this gateway is gonna be in front of that, and what it's gonna do is it's gonna proxy those uh, connections with two key elements. No files or credentials are ever gonna be staged within this DMZ. So it gets away from that traditional FTP type server in the DMZ where you're staging files out there potentially to pick up. This is just gonna stream that information through here. Second thing is, and probably most importantly from a security perspective, no inbound ports are needed to be opened on this backend firewall back to your private network. Way that's done very, very quickly. We open up an egress control channel port. So that's gonna be a port outbound going to that gateway. And it's gonna say, hey, gateway, here's your IP port mappings, basically your proxy information. So that when someone does come in, we'll say it's on SFTP. They'll come into the gateway. It's gonna use that pre-existing channel to go back to MFT and say, hey, I've got you know Tom here. He's coming in on 22. Here's his username, password, SSH key, whatever. If everything checks out, we're gonna open up a separate, and this is gonna be a data channel, that's gonna go out and broker that initial connection. So now that we have data flowing back and forth seamlessly, all being streamed through here, and most importantly, we did not have to open up port 22 here. So that can be a really nice addition, especially if you're on the server side of things and people are actually logging into Go Anywhere on your side. All right, let me get back to my pointer here. Okay, so let's jump into the demo. So let's X out of here. <clears throat> All right, first thing we're gonna look at, uh, let's look at um, one of the authentication methods. So this is, let me make sure I'm in the right box. Localhost, what you'll notice too here as well, uh, when you do install it, it is a web-based console for the administrative console. You don't have to download a client or anything like that. Uh, another quick step back tidbit, it is a Java-based application, really don't get any hooks in the OS, no dependencies, so no matter where you install this, whether it's Linux, AIX, Novell, IBMI, Windows, it'll look the same, just like you're seeing here. I'm going to go ahead and log in uh, with the right account, with my login or admin credentials. And first thing you're going to notice is I used a username and password, and I've also got this one time or TOTP password that I'm doing. Now what you guys aren't seeing is me on my phone right now. I'm particularly using the Google Authenticator. So let's go make sure I pick the right one here. And it gives you that TOTP that's that one time based one time password. Um, you can use Microsoft's app, uh, Duo, anything that does those TOTP. I just happen to be using Go, uh, Google Authenticator. So that's one way that we can do some multi-factor authentication. And this is from the administrator standpoint, so that's a good thing. Uh, so first, first things first, when we jump in here again, just a quick overview on certain things here. Uh, we do have two different types of user roles. We've got administrator user roles, and that's gonna be the folks that are logging into what you're seeing here uh, to do administration. It makes sense. You know, configure web users, set up your service listeners, create projects, uh, anything from a configuration standpoint. Within here, um, as the product stands now, the first, the stable release, we have 16 different RBAC roles. There are a couple in here. This is the beta version I'm running, so I just want to make sure I'm clear on that. There is a web user device manager added, an SLA manager, which was great. But I think what's really cool is they added this add role. This is coming out in the beta version to where now you can get very, very granular. So for example, we had a web user manager. And if you were part of that role, you could do anything with web users. Now, if you wanted to limit that to maybe some of your help desk staff, now we can go in and they call them subject. I won't get too in depth in that, but basically what I'm gonna do is choose 
what's the actual function that I want to do? Well, I want to deal with web users. If I'm dealing with the subject web users, what can I do there? Now, if I was in the web user manager role, I would have all these. But maybe I just want this person or these administrators to be able to create and edit web users. I don't want them to be able to delete them, change passwords, export them, anything like that. Point is, you can get very granular, and it's not just one subject. You can mix and match subjects. So you can add another subject to go to a different subject over here and get very, very granular with what those specific admin users can do. So I think this is a huge game changer. We've had a lot of customers asking for specifics like this for the admin user roles. So this is going to be pretty cool. Again, this is in the beta. That's not out yet, but it will be coming very, very soon. So I think that's a really cool addition to the latest model. The second type of users is going to be your web users. Uh, web users are going to be those folks that you're creating to log in to go anywhere to leverage, again, whatever service you're offering, whether it's uh, SFTP, the HTTPS web client, FTPS, FTP, uh, GoFast agents, a couple of proprietary protocols. That's totally up to you. Now, if we dump, jump into the web users, just a couple key things to look at. Um, login methods, there's going to be a default go anywhere where we're going to have the go anywhere credentials stored in our database. They're going to be uh, hash SHA-512. Or if you add login methods, and that's basically connecting to some sort of directory service, whether it's generic LDAP, IBM Trivoli, uh, Windows Active Directory is probably the most common one. Point being is you can have a different way of managing or having different login methods for the users. On a security standpoint, no matter what service you give them, now you can decide what their actual authentication is, whether it's username and password, whether it's going to be a certificate in all of the listeners except for SFTP, which is going to use a public key, either or maybe you want to do some form of dual authentication. Now, on the HTTPS web listener, there's also going to be an option for hooking up to a RADIUS server, should you have one, whether it's RSA, Duo, Google Auth. Whatever the case may be, as long as it's using RADIUS, you can do a TOTP just like you saw on the administrative users when I first logged in. You can do it from the HTTPS web client. This last one is also a beta option, so it's not in the current model. So for those current Go, Go Anywhere users, you're probably not seeing this because this will be on the beta. But that's going to be our own TOTP kind type of option where it will send either an email or an SMS message, the password to you. Just like any, uh, if you were, say, an SFTP server, you need to decide when they do log in, they authenticate, what do they have access to? So this is where you can be very, very granular and locking them in to what they can actually see. You're going to define virtual folders, so that's what they'll actually see when they log in. And then where they're physically going, that's completely up to you. You, sh you on the back end, decide where they're going. The permissions, this is going to be very, very important from a security perspective. What can they actually do in this physical location that I gave them? So you can get very granular on what they can actually do. And then you can also do disk quotas to make sure that people aren't blowing things up. Um, you can also do IP filters from a security perspective. Uh, for individual users, there's also one at the global level. We'll take a peek at it in a second. But if you know that this user, you want them to only log in when they're at work and you know that external IP, then you can definitely turn that on. And I would suggest doing a whitelist, which is going to deny everybody, but only the ones you explicitly define. So this will prevent users from going to like a Starbucks or something like a public free Wi-Fi that has no password to it. So you can kind of hopefully do your best to ensure that they're at least connecting up to you on a secured network. Time limits, if you know accounts are going to expire, maybe you have 90-day contractors or whatever the case may be, you can expire them on a certain date so you don't have to worry about it. Time of day, I think, is pretty straightforward. Day of week, pretty straightforward. Disable account with no activity. Um, a lot of regulations require this. So maybe you want to do it after 30 days of no activity, 60, 90, whatever you want to do. So it'll automatically disable those accounts. One thing I skipped here was the Features tab. This is going to show you the different protocols that you want to give to certain users. So whether it's SFTP, the web client, FTPS, whatever the case may be, you decide on what they have access to. This horizontal checkbox uh, list here is all dependent upon the HTTPS web client, which we'll take a look at in a little bit. And there's four different modules, which we'll dive into in just a second. 
But speaking of those web listeners, uh, let's kind of go into the service manager. And this is going to be where you configure going over to be on the service side of things. So things like, and I'll just dump, dip into two of them, your HTTPS web client, whether you want to, you know, there's a couple things from a security perspective that are turned off by default, allowing browsers to save login credentials. As you know, that can probably store credentials in clear text on your local machine, which if someone got access to your local machine, that could be a bad thing. Uh, session ID and URLs and embedding within iframes kind of gets to your click jacking, hijacking sessions. So by default, we as a security option do not have those checked, but for convenience perspectives, we allow people to configure it. The HTTP strict transport security, this from an application standpoint, will make sure that the certificates are valid and it will not let you override it. And then a content security policy, make sure that you're only allowing certain content from domains that you define to actually populate. There is a single SAML single sign-on, so if you do have an identity provider that you want to use for your um, uh, logins, you can do single sam SAML single sign-on. And then from the HTTPS tab here, you can do some uh, file-level filtering. So you can obviously not allow EXEs, whatever the case may be. On the listener standpoint, um, pretty straightforward on the SSL tab. You do have enabled SSL protocols. Uh, so this is going to be, this kind of addressed the Poodle um, attack from a few years ago. Maybe you just only want to allow TLS 1.2 because you're a PCI compliant company. And I believe as of now, they only allow TLS 1.2. So that will, from a server perspective, require clients connecting up to you to only use those protocols. And then your Cypher suite. And this gets pretty granular. So probably your security team would Cypher or siphon through these to pick the ones that you want to accept. And then of course the certificate, which we'll talk about in a second, that you apply to make it an actual HTTPS listener. On the SFTP, this is a little bit more, I think, straightforward. You still have the filter options as far as upload restrictions. You have your login failures and login failure delay before they actually get disabled. Your Diffie-Hellman Exchange sizes, you can make it whatever you want minimum to be. And again, similar to the HTTPS, you have Cypher suites here. One other thing that we do have, if you're not sure about these Cypher suites and maybe you need to be FIPS 140-2 compliant, you can do that as well. There is a FIPS 140-2 compliant module. It's just a radio button to turn on and off. What it's doing in a very high level general sense is it's taking away the different algorithms or cipher suites that are not NIST and FIPS 140.2 compliant. So basically your Blowfish, Triple Des, I think only your AES um, ciphers would be actually allowed. Uh, similar to down here, your key exchange algorithms, um, only your 512, 256s are gonna be actually allowed. So that's a way that from a system programmatically standpoint, you can have the system take away certain algorithms that are not NIST approved or FIPS 140-2 compliant. Okay, let me give you another quick overview. We're just gonna talk about resources very, very, very quickly. Um, we're gonna leverage an Amazon S3 bucket, so you can define an Amazon S3 bucket. This is the one we're gonna use. If you're familiar with AWS and S3 buckets, you'll have this information, so you just plop it in there. Every resource you define, you can hit a test button, which is gonna connect for network connectivity as well as any credentials applicable. Database servers, like I mentioned, pretty common, whether you want to query to pull information out or if you get information, you can insert it or update it into your database. Uh, SSH servers, another one, whether you're connecting out to different SSH servers, most likely SFTP servers. And another one that's kind of nice too from a security perspective is looking at those DLP, uh, data loss prevention devices. Now, Go Anywhere doesn't have them natively. That's why we have it as a resource. So if you have a Clear Swift or a Semantic or whatever the case may be, if it's ICAP compatible, we can add that as a resource. Once we define those resources, we'll just jump into projects really quick. I'm just gonna just grab a random one. Oh, actually, let me jump back out here. Also from a security perspective on the folders, you can always choose the permissions that each administrator has. So not, can, not only can you do those can, the, uh, custom RBAC roles, but even at the folder level here, kind of like NTFS permissions, if you're a Windows person, you can get very, very granular on what those actual admins can do. Let me jump into a project just to give you a quick overview. This project designer window is where you're gonna build out your business functions. So kind of like the scripting, just a graphical way to 
put together a certain task to build out that business function. The component libraries, all your different action items. The project outline, once you do grab an item, you can just drag it into the project outline. That's gonna build out your step-by-step -step task. Looks like this one's monitoring email box for emails that come in with that email address. And then we're taking the Excel attachment off of it and grabbing a couple columns out of it and then doing a insert into a SQL database. And I know I flew through that, but I wanna get through a few other things. But just to get you an idea of what I mean when I talk about projects, because we'll do a couple examples. This being just your attribute window, once you do select a task, you need to define a few things, and then we'll have some variables available to us depending upon if they're uh, user-defined, they're just system variables like we have here, they were actually passed into the project at runtime, different things that we can do. I know that was a quick overview, but just want you to get you an idea, at least a little perspective of what we're gonna talk about in a second. Okay, so all those keys that we talked about, how do we manage those, whether they're SSL certificates, whether they're SSH keys, this is gonna be in our KMS. This is a database-driven key management system that can manage your certificates, SSH keys, and PGP keys. So for instance, let's say, and you can do these from cradle to grave. If you don't have any SSH keys, you don't have any PGP keys or certificates, you can create them right here. So from a certificate standpoint, uh, we'll just put in whatever, we'll choose the algorithm. Most people have a certificate in mind or they have a wildcard certificate. Um, uh, MyDomain.com. As you may or may not know, the common name, if you're applying this to an HTTPS listener, this is very, very important. It needs to match whatever the host name is gonna to be to get to that. All this other stuff really doesn't matter. The subject alternate names, again, I don't know how familiar you guys are with this, but you need to make sure that you add that common name, .com, so that you don't get that uh, sand missing error when they actually go there. Point is, you can create your certificates right here. Now granted, it's a self-signed cert, so nobody's gonna trust it in, uh, publicly, but you can do your generate uh, certificate signing request right here. Take this, GoDaddy Thought, VeriSign, whoever you use, paste it into their site, pay them a little bit of money, of course. They'll give you a CA reply, which then you can come right back in here, import the CA reply, and now you have a trusted signed certificate that you can go put on your HTTPS listener, what we just looked at. The other ones won't go through in detail too much because I think the SSH keys and PGP keys are pretty straightforward. It's a public and private key pair, and you can apply them too. Um, your SFTP server and the SSH keys perspective, or you can use public keys to do encryption to send files to somebody, or you can use a public private key pair for your decryption and digital signatures. So different things that we can do with the KMS there. The master encryption key we kind of talked about there real quick. Here's where by default you won't see any master encryption keys. It comes shipped with the product, but once you start adding or rotating, encryption keys, which I'm not gonna do here. You'll start seeing them here. It'll tell you which one's current. And obviously if you create a new one, that old one, you don't have the option to delete because we're still gonna need those old ones to decrypt files that were encrypted using that when it was actually the current one. But again, this is mainly for a rotation of keys. This is gonna be used for you know encrypted folders, go drives, secure mail packages, secure forms, passwords, a lot of those things. This will leverage AES 256 bit encryption. All right, so looking at, and again, we'll look at an example of like encrypted folders. This is a way that we have give you the ability to uh, encrypt data at rest by picking out a specific physical location and encrypting all the contents that go into there. One caveat is it has to go through a go anywhere authorized user for encryption and decryption. So I can't go to this physical location via Windows Explorer and throw a file in there and expect it to be encrypted because go anywhere won't know about it. So it'll still be in plain text and vice versa. You have to go through a going over process to actually decrypt files in this folder. All right, moving along, and I apologize for flying through. I just got a few things to cover. Uh, from the alerting standpoint, uh, very, very important. I'll skip some of the, I think, straightforward ones, the going over service, Java memory, hitting a certain threshold. Uh, obviously, being a Java-based app, we're gonna be very dependent upon Java memory. But two of them that I hold dear, because I've been burnt by this before many, many, many years ago, uh, when certificates are going to expire, that's nice to get an alert. 
so that you don't uh, have your Outlook web access or anything tied to Exchange certificate expiring, because that's a bad thing. PGP keys as well. Um, you don't want your folks to be able to not encrypt or decrypt files, depending upon your partners and who you are having encrypting or decrypting via PGP. And then a couple other ones, gateway services going offline, clustering, going one of the clusters dropping out, you can get notifications on those. If we look at, I think a good one to look at is triggers. So triggers again are gonna be those ways for um, web users, any kind of activity they're doing. And I'll kind of give a couple examples. Uh, account disabled. So this is gonna say, what's my condition? I'm gonna say, hey, if anything, uh, any service that they come in, I don't care what service it is, I don't care what user it is, I just know if an account gets disabled, I wanna send an email to, and it looks like it's going to me, and it's gonna use a couple of variables, so it should say D Freeman when I log in here, uh, was disabled at a certain time. So let's go to the web client really quickly, and let's use the, oh, I think it was disabled, actually what I called it. And let's give ourselves a couple bad passwords, and it should be set to three. Okay, so let's go back to our site here. Let's go to our users and web users and disabled. Okay, it's disabled. Now let's look at my email notification to make sure that trigger worked. Let's pull that over. And here, okay, there's our email that just came in, 1046. And yep, it just says disabled uh, account disabled. Well, that was the name of the user. That was probably a bad choice on my part. Account was this disabled at, and it gives me the timestamp. So that's a good way to stay in the forefront of things like that, especially if you have SLAs tied to these users. That's definitely important. We've also had people using things like um, using the upload or download successful. Um, as you notice, if I go back into the triggers, there's about 35 different triggers that you can trigger off of. I'm just going to choose three of them, just uh, some common examples that I see. Um, but we had someone want to know that, hey, we want users to log in once. Once they download a file successfully, I want them their account to be disabled because they're done. That's all they needed. We can use a download successful trigger to do just that. The condition, we don't care who it is at this point. The action, we're going to call a project, and it's going to call this one-time disabled user. And we're going to leverage a couple of variables. Username and file are going to be just arbitrary, whatever you decide to call them. Their values on triggers, you're gonna get certain different variables. There's tons of different things to choose from. I'm just gonna choose the username and the actual file name. Now, if I go to that project, which I know we talked very, very little about, but if, if somebody downloads a file successfully, that trigger will get triggered, and this will be called, this project, which I'm gonna be leveraging a SOAP server, which is pointing back to our APIs, our Go Anywhere command line APIs, specifically the Update Web User API which has username, which I'm gonna fill in that variable that I'm passing in, as well as the enabled, and I'm gonna make that false. And then send an email. So let's try that one. So let's go back to our web client, and let's log in as that uh, one time. And so this one time user comes in, I download a file. There we go, it goes successfully. Let's go back to our interface here let's go to that user and now he's disabled so that worked and we'll look at that actual this is a job log here or nope my email sorry and here we go there's the email that I got one time which was the user variable was just disabled after successfully downloading and there's that test.txt so I just passed in the actual file name and those are variables that you can use on those triggers to pass into things like this, like an email. The last one is kind of our most popular trigger as far as notifying is gonna be on upload successful. So this one here looks like it's anybody. It's specifically the D Freeman user. And I'm gonna just send an email. And again, leverage maybe just one variable here. And I'm actually gonna attach the file that I upload. So let's go back here, let's log out. And let's log in as D Freeman. That's not right. And let's just go ahead and upload a file. Uh, let's just grab um, this testing CSV. Sounds good. 
So we're going to upload this testing CSV. So now let's go back to our email. And if Office 365 is prompt, we should get another email here. Maybe. Oh, unless it went to junk. Oh, why is it doing that? Yeah, 1050. Okay, yeah, 1050. That's the one that just came in. I'm not sure that I went to the junk. In any case, you'll see there. Actually, you won't see the – let me move that to the inbox because you won't see the attachment if it's in junk. And where did that go? Oh, there it is. Okay. So there we go. So it says test message body. D Freeman was the user variable I passed, and this is the actual file that I passed as an attachment to the email. So again, some nice triggered events to, to really keep you on your toes and stay in the forefront of certain actions that happen. Um, let's look at another one. I realize the time here, but let's look at another one from a monitor standpoint. So let's say, uh, especially from an automation standpoint. So we've got, uh, seen people have, maybe they have their uh, medical review nurses and they're doing review. And then when they get done, they need to send that file to provider A, or in this case, customer A. Um, a lot of times they, they're letting the users do the PGP encryption or the SFTP transfer or something along the lines. In this case, we can just say, hey, we're going to have a folder structure out there. When things need to go to customer A, B, provider A, whoever, you don't need to worry about any of that stuff. You just dump the file in there. So now from go anywhere standpoint, I'm going to have a folder monitor that's saying grab CSV files. I'm looking in customer A, whether a file exists, it has to be a CSV file. I'm going to call this PGP, then SFTP out the door, and I'm going to pass whatever files I grab, whether it's 110 or 100, as this file's parameter to that project. So let's look at that project real quick. And monitors, there we go. PGP, then SFTP. So what it's going to do is the first step, it's going to PGP encrypt it. There's that file variable that's going to get passed in. I'm going to use customer A's public key. Now, you would have had to encrypt their you would have had to import their public key at some point. And then I'm going to SFTP it to partner A's site. And this is actually just going to a S3 bucket under customer A folder. So here's my customer A folder where it should end up. So let's go to that monitor and let's go and activate it. And this is pulling every 15 seconds. Hopefully this doesn't take very long. So again, this could be nice for just telling your customers, hey, or your, your coworkers or uh, staff, just dump the files in there. You don't worry about encryption. You don't worry about sending it to them. Just dump them in there. They're going to take care of the rest. So if we keep refreshing this bucket, there we go. There came our sample and testing PGP files. I'm going to go ahead and disable this while I'm here. And now those actually got not only PGP encrypted before they left, but they went over the SFTP protocol to the right person. So that's good, another good way. Now, instead of humans putting the uh, files in, in the folders, maybe an application, maybe a database does it automatically. Depending upon what this, the query is or the application steps are, that can dump the file into um, the certain folder and go ahead and kick it off that way. Um, looking at the time here, let's kind of look at from a reporting and audit log standpoint. Now we've done quite a few changes just during this, uh, you know, 50 minute session here. Uh, everything from an administrator standpoint. So you're going to see I logged in as go anywhere. So you're going to see a few things. The grab CSV file monitor looks like I changed it from status active to inactive. Yeah, those are a couple of things we just changed. Um, the, here's where we created that certificate, that random goofy certificate. Point is, it's going to give you all the different things that the administrative users are doing. We won't touch on this because that's not in the product yet. That's coming in our beta release here in a few weeks. Service logs, it's going to be individual service logs that you can look at. So we did a couple things via HTTPS. In fact, D. Freeman logged in. Looks like he uploaded a file successfully. And you can hit the spyglass to see what it was, what the physical path was. But you can also see that project kicked off a trigger as well. And that's what this is kind of emulating. So then you can click on that and see what the actual trigger was. Was it successful? What did it actually do? Or you can go to the trigger logs as well. Completed jobs, that's going to be very, very important. Every single project that gets run is going to have a unique project ID. And then you can go in here, and it'll just be a text depiction of everything that happened. 
And then we mentioned everything from a file perspective going in and out. You're going to see, look like I deleted here a couple files, the sample and test PGP file that went out to uh, my Amazon S3 bucket. But all those things are going to get audited as well. With that, kind of looking at the time, um, one of the other, I didn't get to the HTTPS web client features uh, as far as secure folders, go drive, mail, or secure forms. I won't touch on all these. One of the ones I thought was kind of neat, actually, um, uh, is going to be uh, given, given your, maybe your employees or even publicly accessible, or you can do it via SOAP or REST for custom applications. And actually, it's on this one. You can have people log into uh, your web client interface and maybe do have some search criteria to allow them to do some querying on a back end database. So, obviously, you don't want to give them access to the database, or they probably wouldn't know how to do the select statements anyway. This is a super simple form. All I'm giving you is one parameter, but you can see you give as many parameters as you want to pass back to a project, which I know we kind of went over, that can do some SQL queries for you and then spit back maybe a PDF file. So when I hit submit, what's going on in the background is it's taking this one parameter as a minimum salary, it's calling a project that's doing a SQL query, and it's just pulling the information from the wages directory or wages column, where it's greater than 90,000, and it's gonna spit back a file to me. Point being is, this is one of the locations as well. Not only are you doing this information over HTTPS, but this file right here is actually stored in a location, AES 256-bit encryption, using that master encryption key that we talked about earlier. Same thing with secure mail and go drive. The default locations, this is gonna be a packages directory, this is gonna be a go drive directory. Those directories on your internal network are going to be AES 256-bit encrypted at rest, meaning, I couldn't, as a Windows admin or whatever system you put it on, I can't even go back and browse those directories. I have to be an authorized user or recipient of any of these types of um, file exchanges. Um, with that, Brooke, I'll kind of pass it back to you because I just kind of saw the time there. So I definitely want to pass that on back to you here. Sounds good. Can you hear me okay? I can. Okay, great. So before we take a question or two, just wanted to make sure everyone knew a uh, survey will pop up after the webinar ends. We love your feedback. We read all your comments. And if you have any questions that we don't answer today, you can fill those in there and we'll, we'll get back to you. I also just wanna mention really quick, if you liked this intro into Go Anywhere uh, or wanna see any more features specifically in action, you can request a custom demo. We'll do a one-on-one -on -one with you and, and answer any additional questions and go through things. So um, that URL is on the screen where you can do that and then our contact information as well. So with just a couple minutes left, um, Dan, we did get some good questions. I'll okay. read you this one, it's a little bit long, um, but here we go. So we have clients that connect to our Go Anywhere portal. Using MFA for these clients will not be scalable. Our internal users that connect to our portal have access to all client folders and data. Is it possible to require MFA for internal web users, but still allow username and password for external client web users? Yeah, so you can do that. When we went through that, you can turn on MFA in general. Like TOTP is something that you actually have to turn on from a um, system standpoint. But each individual web user, um, you can do one-offs. You can decide what their authentication type is. And two, one thing we didn't talk about is we also have web user templates and web user groups, which if you manage any kind of directory service, it's kind of the same thing. Web user template, just giving somebody a baseline of uh, configuration items. Web user groups going further to kind of give you uh, different things uh, within there. Um, so you can do it obviously at the individual level or kind of via template level. So yes, you can do it um, for some people and not others. Great. Another question, uh, will we need our own SMS client to handle upgrades in 6.1 in reference to OTPs and such? Uh, SMS, yes, um, you have to have your own SMS service. We are not an SMS service nor an SMTP. So yeah, you have to either, either leverage whatever your mail server is for SMTP and whatever SMS service that you have uh, for texting. Yes. 
And then last one here, what about the ability to bulk update web user settings for IP filter time limits and such? Also, is there a way to know which template a web user was created with or applying updates to those users upon update to the template itself? Um, three questions, I think. Uh, yes, you can do the bulk, um, I guess, uh, uploading for or permission setting via the templates um, for, for web user activity. Uh, whether you're creating them from scratch, because when you hit hit scratch uh, or hit the web user within go anywhere, the first thing it's going to prompt you is uh, what template you want to use. If you're doing it via LDAP, each login method is required to tie into a um, template, so you can do it that that way. Um, the third question: If you apply a template to somebody after the fact, it w or I'm sorry, let me let me take that back. If you change a template that somebody has already been applied to after the fact that they've been created, they will not get those updates. I don't know if that was what you asked, but that's kind of how I read it. And the second one, Brooke, can you read the second? It was, I think there was something in the middle that I forgot. Yeah. Is there a way to know which template a, a web user was created with? Oh, that is a good question. I think you can view the actual web user. I can jump in there real quick. Uh, I don't know if this was created by a template or not. Um, I, I don't think this one was. I think this was manually created, but I believe if you go to the view menu, and I kind of flew through that real quick. At the very, yeah, none of these are created by templates. But if you go to view and pan all the way down, it should tell you the groups, obviously the forms, consolidated forms, and the template that was actually used to create this. All right, great. I might have to check on that, but I'm pretty positive there. Unfortunately, I don't have an example in this box. All right, sounds good. Well, we are out of time, so that's all the questions we'll get to, but um, feel free to put more questions in that post-webinar survey. If you have them, we'll get back to you guys. And just want to thank you so much for joining. Um, thank you, Dan, for the great presentation. And we hope everybody has a really great day. Awesome. Thanks, guys.